I was quite tempted to preach on that um, second reading from 1 Corinthians. It's a wonderful text. And uh, I'm not preaching on that, but I, I can't help myself but saying one little theological thing about it. <laughs> when it says you, it's a plural you, by the way, you all are the body of Christ. You all are the body of Christ. And uh, when we commune today, I want you to think of that. Jesus gives us the bread and the wine, his body and blood, and he says, do this remembering me, making us one again. All us members be coming together as one in the body and blood of Christ. That's what I'm sure what he is saying there. Do this remembering me in remembrance of me. It's not just thinking about, it's actually actively becoming part of the body of Christ. So that's enough for that. Okay, let us pray. O God of the prophets, nourish us in the truth of your word that convicted and comforted we may hold fast to Jesus, living as one in the Holy Communion of the body of Christ. Amen. The grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Uh, Jubilee, Jubilee. So Jesus comes home, uh, he goes to church. Uh, Luke tells us that this is his habit. He made it his habit to attend a synagogue on the Sabbath day. The hometown boy gaining something of a reputation in the small towns of Galilee is then invited to read the lesson, the lesson for the day from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he reads from Isaiah 61. You know, his Hebrew is good. Uh, people are kind of impressed. And then after the reading, he sits down to comment on the text, and all eyes are on him. So the hometown folks are ready to size him up. He says, today, God's word comes true. Right now, in your hearing, this scripture is fulfilled. Ah, so what's the text that Jesus reads? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has chosen me, anointed me to preach the message of good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, pardon for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set free the battered and oppressed, to announce this is God's year to act. This is the Lord's jubilee. The Lord's Jubilee year, the Lord, year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus proclaims it is God's year to act, the year of the Lord's favor, the acceptable year, the Jubilee year. All of those expressions referring to the same thing, the Jubilee year. And that he is God's chosen one, the anointed one. And he's come to fulfill the words of the prophet Isaiah. Jesus is the one. He's the one filled with the power of the Spirit. God's Spirit descends upon him at baptism, which has just happened in Luke's gospel progression. He's just been baptized. Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. Now he's, he's uh, full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he's Spirit-led into the wilderness where he faces fasting, trial, uh, temptation. And then Luke's reading of things, or telling of things, the first thing he does is go back to his hometown, Nazareth. He says he fulfills these powerful words from the prophet Isaiah. Well, next week we're going to hear more about how do the people respond. Um, I suppose anyone who stands up and, or in Jesus' case, he sits down to speak, uh, has a little bit of trepidation about what will the people think? What will my hometown folks think, right? My Sunday school teacher, <laughs> you know, my parents and so forth. What will they think? And 
You know, they say that wisdom is often the better part of valor. So a bit of tact and common sense can go a long way. To survive in ministry, one best not badmouth the head of the altar guild. <laughs> not belittle the organist or the pianist. Don't don't laugh out loud at an excessive eulogy. So uh, too much candor can kind of upset some people. That's unacceptable. Uh, preachers want to be accepted. So uh, preachers often smooth over the things that are kind of sharp and edgy, you know, the hard words, and then they, they sugarcoat the bitter hard to swallow message because if the message is more acceptable then the preacher will be more acceptable and keep everybody happy so that they'll be likely all the folks will be likely to come back more likely to put money in the offering plate more likely to give the preacher raise at the next annual meeting it's common sense isn't it it's a good way to run church business. If the church is a business, then you make everybody happy. That's simple politics. Isn't that interesting? Because Jesus is talking politics here. He's talking about issues of social justice. And if we're going to find out next Sunday, as we continue this reading from Luke, Jesus gets himself into a trouble great deal of trouble the hometown boy loses favor with his folks his people his words are unacceptable he barely escapes their deadly fury so here at its inauguration Jesus announces his ministry's theme God lifts up the lowly God aims to turn the world's power system upside down. That structure, you know, where those people are rise to or stay at the top and other people are kept down. The mighty will be brought down. The lowly are raised up. The poor will hear the good news of God. The imprisoned will be pardoned. The oppressed liberated. And as foreseen in Mary's Magnificat, this is God's year to act. It's the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year. Now, we don't hear an awful lot about that, I don't think, in uh, normal teaching, preaching. It's all about biblical economics. I told you it was about politics and such things. We don't hear much about the Jubilee year, but that's what Jesus reads about and pronounces as being fulfilled as he reads from Isaiah. So what is the Jubilee year? What is the Jubilee year? Well, there's a number of places in scriptures, but I think it's best explained perhaps in Leviticus 25. And it's connected there to the sabbatical year, right? So it's the Sabbath of the Sabbath years. Sabbath of the Sabbath years. And it's proclaimed then, and it's enacted every 50th year. The Christian church has understood that the death and the rising of Jesus announces and fulfills the jubilee Ah, that's what we understand theologically. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jubilee. It announces it, proclaims it, and it's to be done. And it's no coincidence, of course, that the season of Easter is a Jubilee. It's a Sabbath of Sundays lasting 50 days. The old order, right? The old world is defeated. Death is defeated. Jesus is risen. Jesus is now Lord of a new world, a new world order of justice and peace. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar or someone else. So Leviticus 25 is part of what we call the holiness code. The holiness codes. God people, God's people must be holy because the Lord God is holy. So Jesus, then, as you know, quotes from that quote. One of the most favorite 
uh, famous quotes of Jesus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I'm the Lord. You should follow this code. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's in the holiness code. And then as is all those rules about a sabbatical year and jubilee year and the whole thing makes it clear and it relates to apparently what you're doing in the forum today that the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's and this, so all these rules from God apply then to the way were to um, live on this earth. It's to be worked out for the good of all people. People steward or farm the land, so they cannot own it in perpetuity. Oh, because the earth is the Lord's. You don't own your land in perpetuity. You get to farm it, you get to steward it, but you don't own it in per perpetuity. Because, you know, then as time goes by, it tends to happen that, you know, some good things happen to some people, bad things happen to other people. Some families may lose some land, other folks uh, gain land, some become uh, poor, some become wealthy. The principle of the Sabbath reminds the people that God is in charge. God is in charge and all people owe their, their livelihood, their well-being their shalom to the Lord God. Those who have plenty are required then to help those who have little. In the Jubilee year, the 50th year, everything is made kind of even. The promised land is God's gift for everyone. So that unrestrained wealth is wrong. It offends God. It makes God very upset. Thus says the Lord. This is all uh, part of the holiness code. Greed is not part of God's holiness. The land needs a Sabbath. It needs rest. The animals need rest. The workers need rest. It's all part of God's Sabbath principle. Trust the Lord God. Don't work seven days a week. You need a break. And so does your servant. God provides enough for everyone. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God who provides enough for everyone. The crucial way to give thanks, of course, is to make certain that everyone has enough. Everyone has enough, thanks to God. The poor provide opportunity for the wealthy to be generous, to show their gratitude to God. They trust God. That's the way scriptures see it. The poor provide you opportunity to show you that you have a holiness of God in you. All economic transactions are subject to God's justice, God's righteousness. Justice, only justice, you shall pursue. Tzedek, Tzedek, Tredolf. Justice, justice, you shall pursue so that you may live in the land that the Lord God gives you. This is God's word that Nehemiah, you know, in that reading that the people are so excited about. They stand virtually all day to hear it. Give thanks. This is the word of the Lord. So that's what Jesus announces in his inaugural sermon. He reminds the people that they belong to God. They are called to live according to God's holiness. God's holiness means that we are to love one another, that we treat everyone well fairly, justly, righteously, so that we may all enjoy the goodness, the riches of God's mercy, the wealth and abundance of God's good creation. There shall be no poor in your midst. And of course, dear friends, this is political talk. It's about social structures, economics. It's about land use, family farms. It's about prices and wages and education and health care and social security. It's about taxes and trade regulations and commerce policies. It's about liberty and justice for all. During Advent, we sang uh, Mary's song. 
in which God scatters the proud in the imagination of their hearts, brings down the powerful from their thrones, lifts up the lowly, fills the hungry with good things, sends the rich away empty. In this new year, let us keep singing the song of Mary. A little ironic today to say, let us keep singing. The song of Mary, while we proclaim the words of Jesus, that this may be the year of Jubilee, the uh, fulfillment of God's justice. So I'm going to put on my mask and just sing one stanza that gives us a sense of Mary's song. Though the nations rage from age to age, we remember who holds us fast. God's mercy must deliver us from the conqueror's crushing grasp. This saving word that our forebears heard is the promise which holds us bound. Till the spear and rod can be crushed by God who is turning the world around. My heart shall sing of the day you bring. Let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. To God alone be glory. Amen. <laughs>